In this first uh, video communication, we've really focused on the topic of venous thromboembolism. Um, it's become uh, very clear that this is a particular problem for the population with COVID-19. And so we've got some uh, opinions from some leading experts in thrombosis and hemostasis. If we look at the COVID-19 pandemic, it's quite clear that there thrombosis is a major byproduct of infection with COVID-19. Uh, and really we've got three types of thrombosis going on. So we have got uh, hospital acquired venous thromboembolism, which we expect to see in critically ill patients. Um, we have got increased rates of stroke, which again, you'd expect to see um, in patients who've got infections. And lastly, because we have got profound inflammation in those who've got COVID pneumonia, uh, we are seeing some microvascular thrombosis secondary to the inflammation. I mean, inflammation's endpoint is thrombosis, so we would expect to see it. Uh, and we also have got pulmonary hemorrhage going on uh, in that inflamed lung too. Um, I think another important area where the venous and vascular specialists can get involved is looking at the thrombotic element of COVID. I mean, at the start of all this, we thought it was primarily a respiratory infection, of, you know, pneumonia. But in fact, it's becoming clearer and clearer. There's a very important thrombotic element to the pathology. Um, and as vascular and venous specialists, we understand the terminology of this. We're used to talking about thrombosis all the time. And certainly once we start talking about using anticoagulants to modify the course of the disease, I think that's going to become extremely important in the, the very near future. What is clear about the COVID uh, infection is that there is a high incidence of venous thrombosis. Um, there is some debate as to whether this thrombosis is any higher than um, any other serious disease, but it does look as though it, it is higher. There is also some debate as to whether the apparently high incidence of pulmonary embolism is in fact an embolism or intrapulmonary thrombosis. But this is an ongoing debate and ongoing research is coming out of it. But whatever, there does seem to be an incidence of venous thromboembolism, which is something in the order of, depending upon which studies you look at, and let's say this is new data coming out and changing all the time, of, anywhere between 25 and 50% of patients, depending upon how ill they are and how you screen for it. It's clearly D-dimers, which are characteristically very high in patients who have severe COVID infection, especially those on the intensive care unit. Um, they are not discriminatory. They don't help you to diagnose a, a venous thrombosis. Um, and so, if the patient is on an intensive care, um, especially on a ventilator, the diagnosis can be difficult to make. Some people have taken the level of D-dimer and said, oh, it's due to coagulation problems. Let's give more um, anticoagulation. And so they've taken the level of D-dimer and said, those are very high D-dimers should have a lot more anticoagulation. And I, I don't see the logic in that at all, because we're looking at the degree of lung injury and we will have thrombosis there, whatever, however much anticoagulation we give, because it's like the horse has bolted. We're just shutting the door. We need to reduce the inflammation. We need to reduce the amount of viral load there. If there's less inflammation, there'll be less thrombosis. You can't stop the thrombosis with anticoagulation. And the problem is when you look at the histopathology of the lungs, you've also got large areas where there's pulmonary hemorrhage. And if you give big doses of anticoagulation, you're going to significantly increase bleeding risk. So we need really to be looking at the amount of anticoagulation we use in clinical trials and not everyone independently going off and thinking about it and coming up with a protocol that can't be tested against standard thromboprophylaxis. Oh, well, that's the crux of the issue. Uh, thrombosis occurs in, in, as a consequence of inflammation. And we still don't know with COVID whether it's inflammation primarily with thrombosis following on or whether there is a primary thrombotic element. 
Um, either way, there's still scope to consider uh, interventions to minimize the, the thrombosis. And there's two elements of thrombosis. Number one, the most important one, is to minimize the thrombosis in the microvasculature of the lungs, which seems to be a very important element of the, of the severe end of the spectrum. Um, but after the acute phase is over, for the survivors, when they go home, they probably have a very significant uh, raised thromboembolic risk for quite a long time after their discharge. So there's a whole element of what's optimal, optimal uh, prophylactic anticoagulation after discharge to minimize the risk of venous thromboembolism. So the difficulty here is that there is no, as yet, clear randomized um, controlled data to really answer this question. Um, Undoubtedly, some people are using increased levels of therapeutic, or rather I should say prophylactic anticoagulation or intermediate dose anticoagulation. And that is based in part upon um, the severity of the illness, uh, looking at the platelet count. If the platelet count is greater than 100, in our, my own institution, they would recommend um, an intermediate dose um, Clexane or anoxaparin prophylaxis, um, the creatinine clearance, um, uh, and uh, in some institutions, but not mine, the D-dimer level. Uh, so some, in, some individuals and some um, institutions are suggesting that if someone has a very high D-dimer level, they should be offered a higher level of venous uh, anticoagulant prophylaxis. As I say, this uh, practice is not yet evidence-based and I understand why it's being done. Um, there is a risk of course that if you overdo it you can increase the risk of bleeding and bleeding is not common in COVID infections um, but there is a chance that if you really, um, for example, there are a small number of cases in which uh, uh, people will give therapeutic doses of anticoagulation even without there being clear evidence of uh, established venous thromboembolic disease those fully anticoagulated patients might be at risk of bleeding. And I, my understanding is that this is the sort of thing that's being looked for in terms of randomized controlled trials now. So uh, when we look at thromboprophylaxis in patients who have COVID-19, uh, we should be using standard thromboprophylaxis uh, and in NHS England, we uh, give weight-adjusted low molecular weight heparin, which according to the trials is the best way forward. We've got a lot of data that goes back uh, to the late 90s, the early 2000s of randomized controlled trials mm -hmm. where about 7,500 patients were put in. And we know that low molecular weight heparin will reduce the risk of VTE by about 50%. Uh, and that it actually is better than unfractionated heparin as thromboprophylaxis. Since those trials were done, the population has got significantly more obese. So the average BMI in the UK is about 28, 29 now. Uh, and so we do use weight adjusted thromboprophylaxis. And we know that obesity is actually one of the things that we see in the patients who have severe pneumonia with COVID infection. Practice now has changed. And the reason why it's changed is firstly, my hospital, which is Glen Eagles Hospital, is one of the decant hospitals for COVID um, in Singapore. So after they've recovered from intensive care and are considered relatively non-infectious, they would be moved in um, from the National Center of Infectious Disease. But also, if there is an overload, our intensive care has been geared up to receive COVID. So thrombolysis is done in an ICU, HDU, high dependency type setting. Patients don't go back to the ward, which means the likelihood of my patient being not far from someone who's being ventilated for COVID is real in the acute, thrombola, in the acute thrombosis scenario. So we are a little more conservative on how we approach it now. We have, uh, since January, done about seven, I think, cases of acute DVT. In general, if it is below the knee DVT alone, we don't intervene with thrombolysis, it's medical management. Uh, whilst 
in the rest of the world, it is only iliac DVT that most people intervene in. Some of us intervene in the femoral segment as well, uh, which, is one, which is what I would do. Um, so we have had uh, seven patients uh, and the approach is that the deferred stenting is no longer being deferred for six to eight weeks. The deferred stenting is being deferred till we decide when it's safe to bring them back in for an elective stent. So that is the only real difference that's happened in the acute iliofemoral DVTs. One question that's very much on our minds is what shape the reactivation of normal life will take. You know, when will the inner specialist start to go back to work and start doing all the things that we used to do? Um, I think there is a danger, I mean, there's always going to be, I mean, obviously everybody wants to get back to normal as quickly as possible and for many there'll be a commercial necessity to think about you know, make, uh, getting our livelihoods back again. Um, but I think we have to be careful because very little venous work is truly urgent. Um, I think just because patients might request it or even demand it doesn't make it urgent or even indicated. And I think as Physicians, we have to show leadership, and um, there, may, there may be a situation where patients are requesting treatment, and we're tempted to provide it. But we have to reflect that, in the process of travelling to the clinic and interacting with the staff, there will still be an ongoing risk of transmission of of the infection. Um, certain things may change that if the treatment gets better, if we get a vaccine that works, or even if we can identify via an antibody test reliably who's immune and safe. And all these things will have a an impact as to when we can start to resume normal life and that's the timing is going to vary from from place to place but I do think it's important that we as medics show leadership in terms of when it's appropriate to go back to normal practice and don't resume it just because um, patients start to uh, request it. Completely the the desire to uh, you know, do one's very best for the patient in an, in an area where you have, in a minority so far, in a minority of cases, a fatal or potentially fatal disease. And so you're trying to do your very, very best. And uh, there is naturally a very strong desire to try anything um, on the basis that well, it may not do any harm and it may do some good. But the problem with that approach is that unless you conduct trials properly, you'll never know whether that's actually beneficial in the long term. And uh, I think that this virus is not going to be a short term thing. And many people now recognize that we're going to have to live with this subject to hopefully there being a vaccine. But we don't know about that yet. So it is important that wherever possible, patients are randomized into put into randomized controlled trials so that we can get the answers, because this problem is not going to go away.